Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. I'm a little out of sorts. Mark's down in St. Joe. <laughs> I'm like, wait, now I have to do announcements this morning. Well, that's all right. I'm glad to be up here and glad to be able to share uh, today with you all. Uh, for those of you who are online, uh, the announcements will be actually posted into the feed, so uh, watch out there. We're going to try something new with that, too. We're going to throw the, the music video links in right at the beginning so you have them. You don't have to worry about musical backup. You know, so uh, if we have any problems with that, let us know so that we can find ways to make that work for you all as well. But to get things started, um, we just finished the Truth Project. The last sermon was last week, and so we're looking at what that was, week 12 of that, and we finished up the, the study on Wednesday night. And so now what? We have a new series. It's called, Is Genesis History? It's a, uh, from Dr. Tackett as well. And this series is going to be, uh, again, a Bible study and a sermon series. We're gonna kick it off this Wednesday night with a movie. And that, so that movie will uh, be about an hour and a half or a little more than that. So our prayer time is going to be a little bit short. So if you have prayers, send them in ahead of time. There we go. That sounds better. And then um, on Sunday next week, we'll kick it off with the sermon series. So we'll do like the high overview on Sunday, and then we'll do the in-depth study on Wednesday night. And there's six weeks of this study. Um, number one is, uh, first one is Genesis as a book of history, and then the first seven days. So, uh, I don't know. These are really hard subjects for me because I don't know which one's going to be the most exciting for me or which one I'm going to enjoy the most. So, uh, looking forward to that. And then we're going to go into man, life, and science, Adam, Eve, and the first sin, the global flood, and the importance of history. As I was looking into this, I was out on their website, they are right now crowdfunding for the second part of this series, which will be um, what happened after the flood. So now I'm excited to see what that one's going to be. But through this particular Bible study and sermon series, we're going to take a fascinating new look at the biblical, historical, and scientific evidence for creation and the flood. And through the Bible study, we will learn from more than a dozen scientists and scholars as they explore the world around us in light of Genesis. And Dr. Tackett, who, again, was the creator of the Truth Project that we just finished, hikes through canyons, climbs up mountains, and dives below the sea in an exploration of two competing views, and those resulting in one compelling truth. So I'm really looking forward to this. I hope you all can join us for it. Um, so that's kind of the, okay, I'm done with the exciting announcements. No, not okay, I'm just kidding. Um, here in a couple of weeks, we're going to have our second, uh, our, our August uh, Orange Track Racing. Uh, that'll be on the 13th. And um, then on the 17th of September, that seems like a long ways out, but it's like seven weeks. It's going to come really fast. Um, we're going to be showing the movie Tulsa, and we'll be showing that for free now. Uh, the links to... The trailer for the movie for it's Genesis History and for the movie are going into the, the live feed right now. But before we leave today, we're going to watch both of those. They're going to take a few extra minutes of your time. So you can see the trailer for the study or the movie and the study as well as for Tulsa. So um, one thing I want to talk about is um, some of the, the pictures you're going to see in the slides today. Um, they're real important to me in a couple of ways. And one of them is just beautiful. But um, the, the couple during the sermons are going to be places that I spent a lot of time as a youth. And that was the former Winnebago Scout Reservation in Marble Rock, Iowa. And you'll see why we're going to be doing that. But then when we get in time for uh, prayers and we bring Denise up here to pray for the people, we're going to have a picture of what is called the Fred W. Sims Chapel, which is located in Greenville County, South Carolina, and it overlooks the rolling hills there. And the, 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 it doesn't matter the season, <laughs> just the picture there. So I chose a picture that I really liked from that. And it's actually a chapel that is at the YMCA camp in Greenville, South Carolina. So um, like I said, you'll understand the significance of some of these pictures here in a moment. 
Now let's rest. Today's sermon title is called Be Still, and with that, we have our call to worship that has a passage out of our larger text that comes from Psalm 46, verse 10, and it's only the first sentence where it simply says, Be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. For the past several weeks, and I think I've mentioned this a couple times, um, God has been speaking to me through this verse, and it happened uh, one morning I was sitting trying to do my devotions, and I was trying to read. And as I was reading the scriptures, my mind went this way, and my mind went that way, and it just, I was all over the place. I could not focus. And God drug me back. He said, God, I'm going to take you back about 15 years to see you at the pole event, and our scripture for that event was, be still and know that I am God. And each morning, before I start my devotions, like in the past few weeks, I've been just praying, Father, help me to be still and know that you are God. This morning, we're going to go on a walk of sorts during our call to worship, though, just to kind of help, help you with that, because this is something that I will do um, during that time frame as well. So it's going to require your imagination. And here's one of those pictures. Now, this, this is a path that leads down through the camp. And I walked this path hundreds and hundreds of times as a youth. So here's the scene before us. We've got this path that's walked, going through the forest. You've got the wildflowers and the wild grass and weeds and all kinds of things growing on either side of the path and the trees are growing up. Beautiful sunny day, not unlike today with a gentle breeze and a coolness in the air that is so wonderful as we think about what's coming. As you're walking down this path, you can hear the grass blowing. You can hear the leaves rustling. You can hear the birds chirping. You might hear a squirrel or two chattering in the trees. Something running through the taller grass that you might not be able to see. Maybe a deer off in the distance just looking at you, wondering what you're doing. This is a scene of serenity. This is a scene of being surrounded by everything that God has created. And whether I can go there physically or just in my mind, this is a serene, a serene spot for me. It's a place where I can slow down just be still. The thing I'd have you do today as we go through the, the message and, and is to think about what is that place for you? Where can you go physically or even in your, as, as it's sometimes said, in your mind's eye? Where can you go to receive that serenity, that stillness, that peace? It's time for us to messiness of our lives to be still. The problem is it seems like every time we turn around it seems like we're racing one place or the next. And I used to do this a lot. I would go from one thing to the next and I'm, I'm a confirmed workaholic. I used to work 100 plus hours a week. I didn't see my family. I didn't get some of the things done that I would have liked to have gotten done. God taught me a lesson in all that, and I was able to slow down, and I haven't stopped slowing down. I, I still go at a pretty good clip, but I do know how to stop and be still. But the problem is, is too, is do you ever have people that just go flying by you, make you feel like you're standing still? It can happen on First Avenue. Yeah. It can happen on the interstate. It can happen in anything, but people are constantly racing <clears throat> around. And does it feel like to you that today, does it feel like things are racing much quicker, like people are moving much <coughs> quicker, like there's so much more to do than there was 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago? We don't just live in a fast-paced world. We live in a world that is 
it has a culture of things being instant and disposable. And we're, or we're immersed in that. Uh, it could be diapers, because I, I know when my oldest was born, we started off with cloth. And they were not much fun, but they were a whole lot cheaper at the time. We've got disposable plates. Even our electronics today are disposable. I remember when I first got into computers, and I'm sure Mark can say the same thing, if something broke on the computer, it was nothing to pull that little chip out or take that piece out and replace it. Today, everything's so integrated, you have to throw the whole unit away. The list that just goes on and on and on. Now, part of this is that we have a, this need and desire to create things that are faster and more efficient, whether they're good for us or not. We want things that are faster and more efficient. Let's face it. It's a lot easier to listen to the music on your phone <coughs> than it was to try and carry around that CD player that if you didn't have the built-in skip protection, <laughs> the music bounced all the time. Kids might be listening going, what's a CD? It's an MP3 player on a little optical disc. Yeah. But whether it's good for us or not, it's how we live our lives now. Uh, it used to be that, and this is this we going back pre-pandemic. You know, used to be we'd just go to the drive-thru. You know, we got the the fast food joint just down here on the corner. We'd go up to the drive-thru, order what we want, pay for it, go home. Some of us would wait to get home to eat it. Some of us would eat it along the way because if you eat along the way, then you have more time to do something else later. It's just faster and faster. And as I was sitting here thinking this, I'm thinking of all the different slogans that are out there, like Arby's, we have the meats, or uh, Burger King. And Burger King is actually shortened her. It used to be have it your way, now it's just your way. And so, and McDonald's is, I'm loving it. But now with the rise of things like DoorDash and Uber Eats, Grubhub, and some of the, the Chomp is one of the local ones, you can just order on an app and they deliver it to your front door. And they literally, they set it down in front of your, next to your door, snap a picture of it that goes into the app to let you know it's there. So now, you know, other restaurants, such as IHOP, where they say, we could all use a pancake, which is kind of making me hungry for pancakes, or Godfather's, which is a pizza you can't refuse, and you can all see the Godfather guy, can't you, in your mind, going, Pizza you can't refuse. <laughs> but he's got like the cotton sound in his cheeks. In <laughs> but it's sped up. We're kind of, we're, it seems like we're moving faster. And it used to be we'd go to the movies. Do you guys remember where there was a movie theater like everywhere around town? There was a, you know, maybe a twoplex here or a fourplex there. And then we got the first 12plex and then we get a 16. And now what do we have? We have one theater that has, what, five in it, six in it, and, uh, and a 16-plex. All the rest are gone. Mm -hmm. They become something else. Now, though, it's just as easy to go home, hit the remote, find the movie you want on whatever service you're watching, take the pizza out of the oven or the popcorn out of the microwave, and you just stay home and do it. Now, let's take those examples. Racing around, getting your food, going to the movies, or staying home. Do we do this with church? Yes. Do we do this with our faith with God? Yes. It's great to have an app on your phone where you can listen to your devotional or whatever as you're driving to wherever you're going. But are you really spending time with him? Are you really hearing what he has to say? Staying still to listen to him. Now, before we go any further in the sermon, we're going to drop back to Psalm 46, the whole psalm. And this is a psalm that celebrates the presence of God in Jerusalem. And as the citizens of Jerusalem enjoy protection, it invites confidence in the Lord. And confidence in the Lord is very important. That's part of our faith. And it, it was through this psalm that one of the great Protestant reformers was inspired. 
He was inspired to write the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. So let's look at this psalm and what it has for us. We're going to kind of stair-step our way through it here. So Psalm 46 is just 11 verses. Let's start with the first three. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. Kind of put some thoughts in your mind. You think of the different things that we hear each day on the, on the news. Uh, I mean, uh, so many places around the world today live in fear of earthquakes. Mm -hmm. I think California. And when I think of California, I think of you know mountains crumbling into the sea. I think of California just falling right off. <laughs> but it's not just natural disasters. There's other things that happen. I remember a kid, as a kid, um, we would, one, we'd do the tornado drill. You know, everybody grabbed the biggest book they had out of their desk. You know, you lift up the desk, grab your big book, you walk out in the hallway, get down on your hands and knees by the locker, and you put it over your head, and you just you sat there like this, hoping that book would protect your head like a helmet. But then some of you might remember the nuclear tests, where you get under your the desk in your classroom. Well, we didn't know that that was to make us feel good about it. It wasn't going to help. No. I think we all knew that. Yeah. But even today, there's there's the, the fear of war. You know, we've got what's going on in the Ukraine right now, and, and certainly Russia is puffing up its chest to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what are they going to do? Well, are they going to do something? But I'm, I'm going to go back to the, the natural disasters really quick because this has just been, these people have been on my, my, in my thoughts and prayers all week. There's been at least 25 people who have died because of the flooding in Kentucky. And then I read a story about a couple. They are fine, but they lost all four of their children. deep sense of, of sorrow of, of, for them. But here's what the psalmist is telling us. He's telling us that even if the world were to end, and their world may feel like it's ending right now, we don't need to fear. When you, when you listen to the very first few words of this, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble, confidence in what God is saying in God's ability not to save him to save us it's without God it's hard to imagine the end of the world let alone our own lives without being consumed with fear and not knowing God that's all you can have really when you think of the end see God is not some temporary hideout someplace that we just go for a, a, you know, the book over your head or climbing under your desk. He is our eternal fortress where God provides us strength in any and all circumstances. <coughs> that brings us to verses 4 and 5. Here what the writer says. He says, A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. I think of that river and I think of Genesis 2.10. This is really one of the first times we hear of a river in, in, in the scriptures. And in there, the writer says, a river flowed from the land of Eden, watering the garden and then dividing into four branches. So it went out. And this river reminds us of a spring of living water. But it's also the spiritual source of life. And that spiritual source of life coming from the throne of our living God. And Jesus has also used that symbol of living water in describing the blessings of salvation. So rivers not only bring life, but they also bring restoration and healing. Y'all remember the, the story of Naaman from 2 Kings 5, where he's this uh, 
important commander in the army, but he is suffering from leprosy. And so what's he do? He goes to see Elisha, the man of God. And Elisha says, hey, just go down to the Jordan, dip yourself seven times, you'll be restored, you'll be healed. Now there's a lot more to that story that you'll, I'm just going to tell you, go read that on your own. Because, um, but this living water can restore us. It also reminds me of what it says in Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal. You all seen that water that's so clear that you can see all the way to the bottom? Mm -hmm. How beautiful that is. <laughs> there you go. Flowing from the throne of God and the, of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit. And with each crop, each month, the leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. So again, we have life, restoration, and healing. This is an abundant, eternal river that's coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. That's such a peaceful, serene place to be, yet then we get to verse 6. The nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. That sounds like anything out of the headlines of today's news. But here's the thing. Pick up a history book. Pick up your Bible, which is also a history book, no matter what the critics will tell you. We'll this is a book about of history. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so join us for Wednesday for as we start is Genesis history. But chaos. And <laughs> I'm sorry. I my mind what I told you my mind wanders. The first thing I thought of when I heard when I was reading this and saw chaos was I, I went straight back to the sixties and watching reruns of Get Smart. <laughs> because he fought chaos. Yes. The organization called chaos. But here's the and kind of walking hand in hand with that chaos is caused by opportunism and that's what they did they look for opportunities and it's also caused by busyness mm -hmm. so we get so busy what happens in our lives the things that we have in our lives tend to just get set down somewhere in the house and stay there for days weeks or years on end but there's also chaos just in the general noise we are inundated with so much information each and every day that all that noise just can cause chaos. But we go back to this passage and we see that God is with us. God is among us. Isaiah 7.14 says as much. Here's the prophecy. All right, then the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And then Matthew says this in uh, chapter 123. He says, look, the virgin will conceive a child, almost a complete um, same reading of it. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is. So in the midst of all this chaos and all the things that are going on in our world, God is with us. Let's read the last part of this. It says, Come, see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. War and destruction are inevitable. Mm -hmm. That's what happened when sin entered the world. What happened? Adam blamed Eve. <laughs> Cain killed Abel. And it just goes on and on from there. The scripture does tell us that in the end, we have the victory. God has the victory. 
it's in that time when all of us, believers and non-believers, will stand before God. That's why it's so important for us to know Him. And we can know God by learning more about Him. We can learn everything humanly possible about God, but still not really know Him. Knowledge is important. We always need to be learning. I'd love to, you know, I love the fact that every single day I learn something new. The challenge then is to be in the Word on a daily basis. And Mark and I can't stress this enough. Be in the Word daily. Even if it's just taking the one verse that, that we got our sermon title from today, be still and know that I've got just that first part of that verse. Just sit and work and pray on that throughout the course of the day. Now, with this coming lesson that we're coming, or this series that we're coming up on, um, I don't know if you guys have the YouVersion Bible app on your phones, mm -hmm. but there is a, a devotional that goes hand in hand mm -hmm. with Is Genesis History, called Is Genesis History on that. And if you do have the app, or if you're going to get the app and sign up on it, um, I would love to go through that with you as a kind of a supplement to everything else that we're doing. Because through the Bible app, you can actually join with other people in doing study on a daily basis. And in that, you go through and you read the devotional and the scriptures that go along with it. And then at the end, you have an opportunity to just give some feedback of what you heard God say, then share that with everyone else. But it's important whether you do that or not, to be in the Word on a daily basis. Now, I like to learn something new every day, like I mentioned. Otherwise, I feel like the day's been wasted. Mm -hmm. Now, more often than not, what I learn new every day is something straight out of the Scriptures, but I learn new things in other parts of my life as well. But faith is more than knowledge. See, it's, it, yes, reading and doing the devotions is important, but it's, that is all about creating that relationship, growing your relationship. Now there are costs and it does take effort and it will take time. And yes, I get up early every day whether I want to or not because that time for me with God is so very important. But sometimes it's more than we're willing to give. Now, things are happening all around us. We may ourselves or we may have friends who are going through rough financial times um, it, it, and it can be hard when you're trying to spend time with them or you're trying to uh, maybe teach and, and walk them with them along this path but what happens as you go along that with them we love them regardless and I like to think that we set an example for them and just because a relationship is difficult doesn't mean that we give up on it. Relationships are hard and they can be messy and oftentimes we just want to walk away because it's easier. How often do we see that in the world today? It's so much easier just to walk away from the relationship than to work on it. But does the same go for our relationship with Christ? That relationship can be hard. Our culture looks down on it. Not as said in the church, but those of us who profess to be Christians because we tend to not be very Christ-like sometimes. This happens when we profess one thing, usually on a Sunday or Wednesday or whatever Bible study night you have, and then the rest of the week we're out doing what pleases us and not worrying about what God wants us to. Oh, but then when we get to service the next Sunday, then we worry about it. The only getting fed on Sunday is a lot like going through that drive through or having food delivered to your home. It doesn't require a lot of time, effort, thought, or resources. Can we live on fast food? I think for a little while we can. It eventually catches up. I worked fast food for 16 years. Um, yeah. I lost 40 of those pounds a few, several years ago. <laughs> It can catch up to you, but it's not, there's not a whole lot of nutritional value in that fast food. And, I, and I've really started to notice that since I've been doing so many uh, 
training classes at work, working the eight to five, it means I've been able to make, help make dinner at night. So we've been grilling a lot. And when we grill and we have, you know, the nice piece of meat, whatever it is, and oh, then there's the veggie. And you can sometimes eat a whole lot more than when you go out to eat. And the next morning, my blood sugars are like 40 points less than if we had gone out to eat. It's because of all the garbage that's in that food, or even in the, the pre-made foods. It's healthier, it's fresher, it tastes better. But it goes back to what I said earlier. Is it just easier to do something else? If we do that with God, I would venture to say that there is absolutely no spiritual value. There's a lot of superficial things in this world, and social media is one of those. It's a great tool for evangelizing, but it's also a, a great time suck for people. Um, I'm reminded, and you may not remember this commercial, but there was a, a Toyota Venza commercial back in 2011. And there's a young girl sitting alone in her home with her laptop at the table, and she's on Facebook, and she's talking about how the fact that her parents, who she just got onto Facebook, only have 19 friends. And she's got somewhere near 700. And as she's sitting there worrying about her parents not having enough friends on social media, they cut away to a picture of, of course, the parents driving that vehicle. They stop, they get out on, you know, they're at a park, and they, then they pan out of it, and you see that they're taking the bikes off the top of the car. And they're not just getting off the top of the car and riding by themselves. They have, like, eight other people that are joining them. There's their in social interaction. The relationships that this girl has on social media and this ad are superficial. Whereas the ones that her parents have are, they're solid relationships. There's fruit to them. Knowledge of God will get you by for a while, but it, it's a real relationship that helps you to be spiritually healthy. So, some churches have come to this. There's a, there are places that you drive up to, and literally, during the pandemic, there were churches that were having drive-up church. I get that. I'm not calling that. I'm just talking about people that just come to church. They kind of pick and choose from a menu of churches, and then they go in, they sit down, they might sing some songs, they listen to a sermon. Maybe while they're listening to the sermon or, or singing, they might be on their phone, checking the calendar, email, seeing what time it is, getting on their social media. Then they pay for it, you know, the offering. They pay for it, and they go home. And here's the thing. If they don't like what they heard, if they don't like what was sung, they didn't like the look of the place, they don't go back. They look for something else. I don't think that's what God has for us. And being part of a church shouldn't be like going out or ordering fast food. Being part of a church should be like sitting down at the dinner table with your family and having, not just eating the food, but having a discussion. And we can come up with all kinds of excuses why we don't have time for God. It might be work. It might be kids. It might be, I just simply forgot. Now, yesterday, it wasn't because I forgot and I'm not blaming the kids, but the kids got up well before we did, and they were they needed things. You know, we've got we had the three and a half month old, we had four almost five year old, and, and that's right, the nine year old, and so they needed breakfast. They needed things. So did I get my time with God right off in the morning? No, because I didn't plan ahead. I should have planned ahead to get up before they would have gotten up, but I made time. And it wasn't something that I did just to get it done. It's because I needed to call myself. I needed to center myself. I needed to hear what God had. Galatians 6, 7 says, As a man reaps what he sows. So if you do not have time to spend to cultivate a relationship, you get out of it what you put into it, which is nothing. If you don't have time to cultivate your relationship with your spouse, what happens? You get it out of it, what you put into it. Nothing. 
I do my best to put time into my relationship with Diane and I know she does a better job at that than I do. But I must be doing something right because we'll celebrate 22 years of marriage this November. Yep, life is messy. Mm -hmm. It was especially messy the last couple of days with the baby spitting up on you. But, you know, <laughs> it can be hard. So they wore us out. <laughs> I mean, our own, our, old, our youngest is 29. So when you drop that down, you know, 20 years and you're doing things that you didn't do before. So it's, it can be hard. And sometimes it can be out of control. Briar did smack Ashlyn because he didn't like something she did in the car. She cried, started to spiral her out of control, but he listened. She wasn't happy, but things got taken care of. You know, and, and, and it was hard and it was a bit messy, but we came back around and we got things taken care of. And it all goes back to this, where God says in 46.10, be still and know that I am God. God wants us to take comfort in knowing that He is there when life is out of control. When everything is spinning out, He is in control. This has been, you know, I, I, I keep saying this has been especially important to me the last few weeks. Well, on Friday I had my second interview for the, the position that I'm looking at at my job. And now the, the hard part comes in. I have to wait. I have to sit and be still. <laughs> it's like, I, I'm really glad I have one more week of training with this current class, and then the following week we, we worry about shift bid. And so I have things to keep my mind um, taken care of at work, but I have to just understand that God's in control, and if that's not what he has for me, the job that I have is secure. He's given me something, that, and he's given me the gifts and talents to do that job, so whether I get it or not doesn't really matter. That's what he wants us to do. And in that moment, I had lots of conversations with him. And that's what he wants. He wants us to sit down and talk about life with him. He already knows it all. Just like you know what your kids were doing. You know, we might think that we left the house early in the morning during the summer when we were kids and we came back when the street light came on mm -hmm. and mom and dad had no idea. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they had phones. They knew where you were. They may have called to the other parents. They knew. They didn't need social media. They had their own way of finding out, but they knew. But they still want to do to sit down and talk about life. And when you think, if those of you that have kids, you know that you wanted your kids. And even as they're growing up, or maybe be adults, you want them to talk about what's going on in their life. And that's what he wants with us as a relationship, and that's what we want with our kids. So it kind of puts the two things in perspective. Now here at Gray Street, we want people to have an authentic and loving and nurturing relationship, not just with each other, because that's important. That's what helps us. Iron sharpens iron. That's the proverb tells us. But it's also about having an authentic, loving, and nurturing relationship with Jesus Christ. It's important to us here that people hear God's word. And even more importantly, unfiltered from the, what the world thinks that should be. We want people living a Christ-centered life by teaching them the importance of God's Word and how it is just as relevant today as it was when it was written. And, and when it was written happened long after it actually happened. They, they had people that memorized all this. And that's how they did all their life was repeated and repeated until they got it right. And then they passed that along generation to generation that important to them. And it amazes me how some things that you run across can sum up something else so very well. So I ran across this poem by David Leatherwood. It's called Slow Dance. This is kind of like the, the chorus to the poem. But listen to, listen to this. He says, have you ever watched kids on a merry-go-round or listen to rain slapping the ground? Ever followed a butterfly's erratic flight or gazed at the sun into the fading light? You'd better slow down. Don't dance so fast. 
time is short, the music won't last. Do you run through each day on the fly when you ask, how are you, do you hear the reply? When the day is done, do you lie in your bed with, a hundred, with the next hundred chores running through your head? You better slow down, don't dance so fast. Time is short, the music won't last. Ever told your child, we'll do it tomorrow, and in your haste, not seen his sorrow. Ever lost touch, let a good friendship die, because you never had time to call and say hi. You better slow down, don't dance so fast. Time is short, the music won't last. When you run so fast to get somewhere, you miss half the fun of getting there. When you worry and hurry through your day is like an unopened gift thrown away. Life is not a race, so take it slower. Hear the music before the song is over. Hmm. Busy Christian isn't a necessarily a good Christian. Mm -hmm. Radio announcer on an old radio station used to say that. Mm -hmm. He's now one of your pastors. He's not here today. <laughs> he, I used I, 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 whatever reason you remember things like that, mm -hmm. and I, that was one thing I remember from when he was on KWF here in Cedar Rapids. Mm -hmm. This poem reminds me of a song from Cat Stevens. Mm -hmm. Cats in the Cradle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cats in the Cradle and the Silver Moon. Mm -hmm. Little Boy Blue and the Man on the Moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when we'll get together then. Mm -hmm. Do you do that with God? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we just need to lay down in the grass, look up into the clouds, mm -hmm. and talk with the Father. Mm -hmm. Father God, Teach us to wait, to patiently and quietly wait. Father, we want to worship you. We want to listen to you. Life gets in the way. Life goes so fast. Help us to slow down and remember that we need to be still. And be reminded that you To know that you are God is to have a relationship with you, Father. And I pray that for each and every person here today, watching online, or that will be watching somewhere online in the future. The people that we come into contact, our families, our friends, our co-workers. I pray for softened hearts for those who don't know you, Father. That they would be willing to hear your <clears throat> message of hope that they would also be willing to slow down and to find out that you are God. Guide us and direct us, Father, through each and every part of our day so that we can live the life that you planned for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, but there I go walking away forgetting Mark's not here. Lisa's <laughs> 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 going on something. <laughs> but here's one of the other slides, and this is the chapel at the camp. And you can see the stone altar, and you can see the the pulpit there and the cross, and then the cross up at the top. I spent a lot of time sitting on one of these benches just contemplating. So as we take communion today, put yourself in a place like that where you can spend time with God. See, for it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do you notice he's, he's He's on his way. He knows where 
where the night will lead. But yet in the busyness of that, in the noise of that, in the opportunity of, of that that Judas is taking, Jesus still took time to slow down and break bread with the disciples. And then towards the end of the meal, he took the cup and after filling, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you, telling us that our sins are forgiven through Scripture tells us that as often as we do this, we are to do this in remembrance of Him. We take communion this morning to be reminded of the Scripture that says, Be still, now that I am God, the body of Christ broke for you. Take. The blood of Christ shed for you. Father, thank you for reminding us each and every time that we come together through this act of communion that you are God and that it does give us that time to slow down and be still and remember that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. day yesterday too. We, um, Steve and I went to the um, Dubuque Arboretum and it had the most beautiful flowers and beautiful plants and I mean if, if you've ever just looked at a flower that God has made and just saw the several petals and the beautiful colors and I mean it's just an amazing thing. You're just in awe. And there was this grass there that I had never seen before. And it was almost as tall from the floor to the ceiling and it was almost like bamboo and it had several leaves on it and you can make a wall out of this grass and I was just in awe of this grass I thought it looked plastic you know but God has made this and created it for us and all these beautiful things <coughs> so yes let's be still and know he is God and so today I'm going to pray for the people uh, with the flood of Eastern Kentucky, for Carla's uh, family, for their sudden loss of their Aunt Mary, uh, for Mark's travels. Um, I wanna thank God for my daughter and her son. They are on the plane right now coming back home from Texas. So I'm very grateful that they made it to the airport in, in uh, Dallas at three in the morning. <laughs> so oh, I know, and so, and they are very tired and they had a great time with their children with her children so is there anyone else that would like prayer this morning okay so father god we just want to thank you for life and breath for love of family and friends that stand with us through the trials of this life we praise you for who you are lord of lords king of kings prince of peace the great i am we come before you this morning and ask for your Holy Spirit to reign in this church and amongst your people and with those online, that they may feel the power of your presence working in their lives. I pray that the Holy Spirit will move throughout America so that they will humble themselves before you and, will, and you will restore our land and heal our nation, Lord God, that we will be a nation under you, O oh God. Oh, Lord Jesus, we lift up the people in eastern Kentucky. We ask for your mercy on those people. We ask that you stop the rain and cease the flooding. We know in this life there will be great trials and catastrophes of all kinds. I pray that people there will gather together and help one another as you have called them to do. I pray for comfort, for they have lost loved ones and everything they have worked for. Only you can help them through this mental strain and anxiety, fear and depression, 
that comes from enduring loss of this magnitude. We ask that people will find you through this trial, Lord, and humble themselves, call upon your name, so that they may hear from you to guide them through this and heal their lives and the land that they live in, as only you can. I pray for safe travels for Mark as he travels to and from. Um, he's been gone a lot this summer, and I just pray for Lori that you comfort her heart and give her protection while he is away, and give her uh, people that will help her in anything she needs. I pray peace and comfort over Carla and Bill as they are on their vacation, um, with Carla losing her aunt this week. I pray the love of family and friends will be with them and they, as they continue their journey. And Father God, we are so thankful you hear our prayers, that you have compassion for us. We are so grateful that you call us your children. By your grace and mercy, we are healed, we are comforted, we are saved, and we have peace in our lives. Help us to know that you are God. Let us be still. And praise be to God Almighty. In Jesus' name. you can read it or not, it's a little small, but on the beam that goes across the altar here from Psalm 121.1, here it says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Actually, I know why they picked it. To the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord. This portion of our service. In the last part of it, Paul has a prayer for spiritual growth. And he ends that section. close out this time online together. Now all glory to God work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. 